Sunday, 27 September 1942. Dear Kitty, Just had a big bust-up with Mummy for the upteenth time. We simply don't get on together these days, and Margot and I don't hit it off any too well either. As a rule, we don't go in for such outbursts as this in our family. Still, it's by no means always pleasant for me. Margot's and Mummy's natures are completely strange to me. I can understand my friends better than my own mother. Too bad. We often discuss post-war problems, for example, how one ought to address servants. Mrs. Von Don had another tantrum. She is terribly moody. She keeps hiding more of her private belongings. Mummy ought to answer each Von Don disappearance with a Franck disappearance. How some people do adore bringing up other people's children in addition to their own. The Von Dons are that kind. Margot doesn't need it. She is such a goody goody, perfection itself. But I seem to have enough mischief in me for the two of us put together. You should hear us at mealtimes, with reprimands and cheeky answers flying to and fro. Mummy and Daddy always defend me stoutly. I'll have to give up if it weren't for them. Although they do tell me that I mustn't talk so much, that I must be more retiring and not poke my nose into everything, still I seem doomed to failure. If Daddy wasn't so patient, I'd be afraid I was going to turn out to be a terrific disappointment to my parents. And if they are I take a small helping of some vegetable I detest, and make up with potatoes, the Von Dons, and Mevralf in particular, can't get over it, that any child should be so spoiled. Come along, Anna, have a few more vegetables, she says straight away. No, thank you, Mrs. Von Don, I answer. I have plenty of potatoes. Vegetables are good for you. Your mother says so, too. Have a few more, she says, pressing them on me until Daddy comes to my rescue. Then we have from Mrs. Von Don. You ought to have been in our home. We were properly brought up. It's absurd that Anna's so frightfully spoiled. I wouldn't put up with it if Anna were my daughter. These are always her first and last words. If Anna were my daughter, thank heavens I'm not. But to come back to this upbringing business... There was a deadly silence after Mrs. Von Don had finished speaking yesterday. Then Daddy said, I think Anna is extremely well brought up. She has learned one thing anyway, and that is to make no reply to your long sermons. As to vegetables, look at your own plate. Mrs. Von Don was beaten, well and truly beaten. She had taken a minute helping of vegetables herself, but she is not spoiled. Oh, no. Too many vegetables in the evening make her constipated. Why on earth doesn't she keep her mouth shut about me? Then she wouldn't need to make such feeble excuses. <laughs> it's gorgeous the way Mrs. Von Don blushes. I don't, and that is just what she hates. Yours, Anna. Monday, 28 September 1942. Dear Kitty, I had to stop yesterday, long before I'd finished. I just must tell you about another quarrel, but before I start on that, something else. Why do grown-ups quarrel so easily, so much, and over the most idiotic things? Up till now I thought that only children squabbled, and that that wore off as you grew up. Of course, there is sometimes a real reason for a quarrel, but this is just plain bickering— I suppose I should get used to it, but I can't, nor do I think I shall as long as I am the subject of nearly every discussion. They use the word discussion instead of quarrel. Nothing, I repeat, nothing about me is right. My general appearance, my character, my manners are discussed from A to Z. I'm expected, by order, to simply swallow all the harsh words and shouts in silence, and I am not used to this. In fact, I can't. I'm not going to take all these insults lying down. I'll show them that Anna Frank wasn't born yesterday. Then they'll be surprised, and perhaps they'll keep their mouths shut when I let them see that I'm going to start educating them. Shall I take up that attitude? Plain barbarism. I'm simply amazed again and again over their awful manners and especially stupidity, Mrs. Von Don's. But as soon as I get used Am I really so bad-mannered, conceited, headstrong, pushing, stupid, lazy, etc., etc., as they all say? Oh, of course not. I have my faults, just like everyone else, I know that. But they thoroughly exaggerate everything. 
Kitty, if you only knew how I sometimes boil under so many jibes and jeers, and I don't know how long I shall be able to stifle my rage, I shall just blow up one day. Still, no more of this. I've bored you long enough with all these quarrels. But I simply must tell you of one highly interesting other, discussion we got on the, the subject of Pim's, Daddy's nickname, extreme modesty. Even the most stupid people have to admit this about Daddy. Suddenly, Mrs. Von Don says, I, too, have an unassuming nature, more so than my husband. Did you ever? This sentence in itself shows quite clearly how thoroughly forward and pushing she is. Mr. Von Don thought he ought to give an explanation regarding the reference to himself. I don't wish to be modest. In my experience, it does not pay. Then to me, take my advice, Anna, don't be too unassuming. It doesn't get you anywhere. Mummy agreed with this, too. But Mrs. Von Don had to add, as always, her ideas on the subject. Her next remark was addressed to Mummy and Daddy. You have a strange outlook on life. Fancy saying such a thing to Anna. It was very different when I was young, and I feel sure that it still is, except in your modern home. This was a direct hit at the way Mummy brings up her daughters. Mrs. Von Don was scarlet by this time. Mummy, calm and cool as a cucumber. People who blush get so hot and excited. It is quite a handicap in such a situation. Mummy, still entirely unruffled, but anxious to close the conversation as soon as possible, thought for a second, and then said, I find, too, Mrs. Von Don, that one gets on better in life if one is not over-modest. My husband now, and Margot and Pater are exceptionally modest, whereas your husband, Anna, you and I, though not exactly the opposite, don't allow ourselves to be completely pushed to one side. Mrs. Von Don, but, Mrs. Frank, I don't understand you. I'm so very modest and retiring. How can you think of calling me anything else? Mummy, I did not say you were exactly forward, but no one could say you had a retiring disposition. Mrs. Von Don, let us get this matter cleared up once and for all. I'd like to know in what way I am pushing. I know one thing. If I didn't look after myself, I'd soon be starving. This absurd remark in self-defense just made Mummy rock with laughter. That irritated Mrs. Von Don, who added a string of German-Dutch-Dutch-German expressions until she became completely tongue-tied. Then she rose from her chair and was about to leave the room. Suddenly her eye fell on me. You should have seen her. Unfortunately, at the very moment that she turned round, I was shaking my head sorrowfully, not on purpose, but quite involuntarily, for I had been following the whole conversation so closely. Mrs. Von Don turned round and began to reel off a lot of harsh German, common and ill-mannered, just like a coarse, red-faced fishwife. It was a marvelous sight. If I could draw, I'd have liked to catch her like this. It was a scream, such a stupid, foolish little person. Anyhow, I've learned one thing now. You only really get to know people when you've had a jolly good row with them. Then, and then only, can you judge their true characters. Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 29 September, 1942. Dear Kitty, Extraordinary things can happen to people who go into hiding. Just imagine, as there is no bath, we use a wash tub. And because there is hot water in the office, by which I always mean the whole of the lower floor... All seven of us take it in turns to make use of this great luxury. But because we are all so different, and some are more modest than others, each member of the family has found his own place for carrying out the performance. Pater uses the kitchen in spite of its glass door. When he is going to have a bath, he goes to each one of us in turn and tells us that we must not walk past the kitchen for half an hour. He seems to think this is sufficient. Mr. Von Don goes right upstairs. To him it is worth the bother of carrying hot water all the way, so as to have the seclusion of his own room. Mrs. Von Don simply doesn't bathe at all at present. She is waiting to see which is the best place. Daddy has his bath in the private office, Mummy behind a fire guard in the kitchen. Margot and I have chosen the front office for our scrub. The curtains there are drawn on Saturday afternoon, so we wash ourselves in semi-darkness. However, I don't like this place any longer, and since last week I've been on the lookout for more comfortable quarters. Pater gave me an idea, and that was to try the large office W.C. 
There I can sit down, have the light on, lock the door, pour my own bath water away, and I'm safe from prying eyes. I tried my beautiful bathroom on Sunday for the first time, and although it sounds mad, I think Last it is the week, best place of all. The plumber was at work downstairs to move the drains and water pipes from the office WC to the passage. This change is a precaution against frozen pipes, in case we should have a cold winter. The plumber's visit was far from pleasant for us. Not only were we unable to draw water the whole day, but we could not go to the WC either. Now, it is rather indecent to tell you what we did to overcome this difficulty. However, I'm not such a prude that I can't talk about these things. The day we arrived here, Daddy and I improvised a potty for ourselves. Not having a better receptacle, we sacrificed a glass preserving jar for this purpose. During the plumber's visit, nature's offerings were deposited in these jars in the sitting room during the day. I don't think this was nearly as bad as having to sit still and not talk the whole day. You can't imagine what a trial that was for Miss Quack Quack. I have to whisper on ordinary days, but not being able to speak or move was ten times worse. After being flattened by three days of continuous sitting, my bottom was very stiff and painful. Some exercises at bedtime helped. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 1 October 1942. Dear Kitty, I got a terrible shock yesterday. Suddenly, at eight o'clock, the bell rang loudly. Of course, I thought that someone had come. You'll guess who I mean. But I calmed down a bit when everyone said it must be some urchins or perhaps the postman. The days are becoming very quiet here. Levin, a small Jewish chemist and dispenser, works for Mr. Crawler in the kitchen. He knows the whole building well, and therefore we are always afraid that he'll take it into his head to have a peep in the old laboratory. We are as quiet as mice. Who, three months ago, would ever have guessed that Quicksilver Anna would have to sit still for hours, and what's more, could? The twenty-ninth was Mrs. Von Don's birthday. Although it could not be celebrated in a big way, we managed a little party in her honor— with a specially nice meal, and she received some small presents and flowers. Red carnations from her husband. That seems to be a family tradition. To pause for a moment on the subject of Mrs. Von Don, I must tell you that her attempts to flirt with Daddy are a source of continual irritation for me. She strokes his face and hair, pulls her skirt right up, and makes so-called witty remarks, trying in this way to attract Pym's attention— Pim, thank goodness, doesn't find her either attractive or funny, so he doesn't play ball. Mummy doesn't behave like that with Mr. Von Don. I've said that to Mrs. Von Don's face. Now and then, Pater comes out of his shell and can be quite funny. We have one thing in common, from which everyone usually gets a lot of amusement. We both love dressing up. He appeared in one of Mrs. Von Don's very narrow dresses, and I put on his suit. He wore a hat and I a cap. The grown-ups were doubled up with laughter, and we enjoyed ourselves as much as they did. Ellie has bought new skirts for Margot and me at Biencourse. The material is rotten, just like sacking, and they cost twenty-four florins and seven and a half florins, respectively. What a difference compared with before the war. Another nice thing I've been keeping up my sleeve. Ellie has written to some secretarial school or other and ordered a correspondence course in shorthand for Margot Pater and me. You wait and see what perfect experts we shall be by next year. In any case, it's extremely important to be able to write in a code. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 3 October 1942. Dear Kitty, there was another dust-up yesterday. Mummy kicked up a frightful row and told Daddy just what she thought of me. Then she had an awful fit of tears, so, of course, off I went, too. And I'd got such an awful headache anyway. Finally, I told Daddy that I'm much more fond of him than Mummy, to which he replied that I'd get over that. But I don't believe it. I have to simply force myself to stay calm with her. Daddy wishes that I would sometimes volunteer to help Mummy when she doesn't feel well or has a headache, but I shan't. I am working hard at my French and am now reading La Belle Nivernez. Yours, Anna. Friday, 9 October 1942. Dear Kitty, I've only got dismal and depressing news for you today. Our many Jewish friends are being taken away by the dozen. 
These people are treated by the Gestapo without a shred of decency, being loaded into cattle trucks and sent to Vesterborg, the big Jewish camp in Drenthe. Vesterborg sounds terrible. Only one washing cubicle for a hundred people, and not nearly enough lavatories. There is no separate accommodations. Men, women, children all sleep together. One hears a frightful immorality because of this, and a lot of the women, and even girls who stay there any length of time, are expecting babies. It is impossible to escape. Most of the people in the camp are branded as inmates by their shaven heads, and many also by their Jewish appearance. If it is as bad as this in Holland, whatever will it be like in the distant and barbarous regions they are sent to? We assume that most of them are murdered. The English radio speaks of their being gassed. Perhaps that is the quickest way to die. I feel terribly upset. I couldn't tear myself away when Miep told these dreadful stories, and she herself was equally wound up for that matter. Just recently, for instance, a poor old crippled Jewess was sitting on her doorstep. She had been told to wait there by the Gestapo, who had gone to fetch a car to take her away. The poor old thing was terrified by the guns that were shooting at English planes overhead and by the glaring beams of the searchlights. But Miep did not dare take her in. No one would undergo such a risk. The Germans strike without the slightest mercy. Ellie, too, is very quiet. Her boyfriend has got to go to Germany. She is afraid that the airmen who fly over her home will drop their bombs, often weighing a million kilos on Dirk's head. Jokes such as, he's not likely to get a million and it only takes one bomb, are in rather bad taste. And Dirk is certainly not the only one who has to go. Trainloads of boys leave daily. If they stop at a small station en route, sometimes some of them manage to get out unnoticed and escape. Perhaps a few manage it. This, however, is not the end of my bad news. Have you ever heard of hostages? That's the latest thing in penalties for sabotage. Can you imagine anything so dreadful? Prominent citizens, innocent people, are thrown into prison to await their fate. If the saboteur can't be traced, the Gestapo simply puts about five hostages against the wall. Announcements of their deaths appear in the papers frequently. These outrages are described as fatal accidents. Nice people, the Germans. To think that I was once one of them, too. No, Hitler took away our nationality long ago. In fact, Germans and Jews are the greatest enemies in the world. Friday, 16 October 1942. Dear Kitty, I'm terribly busy. I've just translated a chapter out of La Belle Nivernaise and made notes of new words. Then a perfectly foul math problem and three pages of French grammar... I flatly refuse to do these math problems every day. Daddy agrees that they're vile. I'm almost better at them than he is, though neither of us are much good and we often have to fetch Margot. I'm the furthest on of the three of us in shorthand. Yesterday, I finished The Assault. It's quite amusing, but doesn't touch Youp de Hill. As a matter of fact, I think Sissy Van Marksveld is a first-rate writer. I shall definitely let my children read her books. Mummy, Margot, and I are as thick as thieves again. It's really much better. Margot and I got in the same bed together last evening. It was a frightful squash, but that was just the fun of it. She asked if she could read my diary. I said, yes, at least bits of it. Then, then I asked if I could read hers, and she said yes. Then we got on to the subject of the future. I asked her what she wanted to be, but she wouldn't say and made a great secret of it. I gathered something about teaching. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I think so. <laughs> really, I shouldn't be so curious. This morning, I was lying on Pater's bed, having chased him off at first. He was furious with me, not that I cared very much. He might be a bit more friendly with me for once. After all, I did give him an apple yesterday. I asked Margot if she thought I was very ugly. She said that I was quite attractive and that I had nice eyes. Rather vague, don't you think? Till next time, yours, Anna.